So let's meet our panel. First, one of only two survivors of last year's session when he said, my job is to grow the channel, increase the impacts, and keep the viewers coming. So how has he done in the last 10 months? 12 months, Director of Programs for Channel 5, Ben Frau. Popular member. Next, controlling BBC One, Two, Four, Sport and the iPlayer and a budget of a billion pounds. She made headlines at Edinburgh two years ago when she had not just two powerful men, but three fighting over her. The BBC's Director of Content, Charlotte Moore. When he left Channel 4, he says a receptionist at the South Bank said to him, Channel 4, what a great place to work, much better than here. Now he's director of television at ITV and presumably her boss, Kevin Ligo. <coughs> and next, the woman who succeeded him at Channel 4 and promptly complained of the, st the strategic failure that she'd inherited. Five years on, she doesn't have to <laughs> worry about Big Brother. Instead, it's naked attraction that's catching the flack. Chief Creative Officer of Channel 4, Jay Hunt. And finally, he's worked for Rupert Murdoch's companies for almost 35 years. Broadcast calls him one of the incredibly influential lieutenants who develop and push new strategies. The bosses of all Sky channels answer to him. Sky Managing Director of Content, Gary Davey. So let's hear it please again for the premier players of British Broadcasting. Now, at the McTaggart lecture last night, I imagine most of you were there, Shane Smith from Vice certainly threw down the gauntlet and this challenge to broadcasters. Media today is like a private club. It's so closed that most young people feel completely disenfranchised. You have to hand it over to the kids. Young people have to shoot it. They have to cut it. They have to host it. They have to do it all. There's a language, there's a tonality, and you can't fake it. This generation is the smartest, most educated, most savvy generation in history. So what do our bunch of baby boomers made with the Shane Smith speech? What action points do they take away? Jay Hunt. I mean, I, I think it was a rather extraordinary speech in the sense I think it was probably the best defence of public service television that I've ever heard. As he sat there and said, you know, we need to go out there and tell the world about big issues. We need to communicate with people. We need to make them aware of what's going on in the world. And I thought, yeah! And I thought, yeah, that's what we do. And actually, in the British market, it is enshrined in law. You know, Channel 4, all the BBC are there to do just that. So I think that part of it felt like a massive pat on the back for this sector, I think. What did you think, Kevin? A genuine disruptor or Emperor's New Clothes? Um, I'm trying not to use the word odious, but oh, I, I think you just have. I think I just have. No, he was, um, uh, oh, yes. He, he does do a very good Scottish accent, um, genuinely. Uh, no, I, I agree with Jay. I think he, he, it's interesting, the first half was all about consolidation of business and takeovers and... I'm sure half the room, you know, was falling asleep. But then he, he revved it up. He dropped some acid, as he kept telling us. And uh, he, um, his, his point that was, I thought, good was his sort of passion for uh, the message of media and the responsibility that we have and looking towards young people to bring them on and all that. So that was quite good. But otherwise, it was... You've got to remember that if ever there's a business where you can judge us all by actually what we put out on telly. Um, you know, Vice, how, you've got to think how much you watch, what do you really think of it. I loved all, I loved the fact that all of his clips that he was in, <laughs> and, and there he was, this sort of, you know, Byzantine iconoclast who in the end wanted to talk to Obama and hang out with some scientist. And, uh, uh, but it was, it was great, he's marvellous son, I wish them all the luck in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Do we believe that? 
Oh, Gary Davy, I mean, Sky used to be the outsider, the rebellious kid on the block, but you're probably MSM yourselves now. What did you make of the speech? Uh, well, I think we all have to acknowledge that we probably need to encourage more young people to be active in the creative process. I think that's true. But I think we're already doing a lot of what he was advocating. I think Jay was right. That there's an awful, awful lot of that kind of content uh, already in this country. And we've got a fantastic diversity of channel types and program types. If you combine public broadcasting with commercial broadcasting and pay TV in this country, it's a fantastic breadth of choice. And I think we're effectively servicing lots of target groups. So I think he's kind of missed the point a little bit. We're already doing it. It's really weird, almost at the stage where we need a right of reply from Shane Smith, and I never thought we'd need that. Charlotte, what did you make of it? Well, I, you know, I thought what was kind of really interesting for us all, and I think it doesn't matter whether you're online, whether you're in the digital world, or whether you're in a terrestrial world, or whether you're which platform you're on, but actually content and really good storytelling is still the thing that really matters, and it's still the thing that, you know, it's king. So, and I, and I think it showed me that um, in America, that still feels like making that content is really radical and really revolutionary. Actually, the networks do not show films about climate change, about women, about... And actually, yeah, it, you know, I think that's why for us it's so important that in this country we continue to really value that that is exactly what we're here to do. Um, so I thought it was a good rallying cry to say, yeah, let's get young people to tell their stories about those issues that matter to them. Um, and I think I'd, I'd applaud that. But I think um, it shows us just how precious what we have in this country uh, across broadcasting that we do tell those stories. Now, Ben, you actually skived off this speech, didn't yeah, you? You didn't go. You didn't go. No. you didn't go. But I think you've picked up the gist. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't go. Uh, that would have been uh, an hour and a half of my life wasted. I mean, just seeing that clip, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've done really well for 1634, and I really love encouraging young talent, but I'm not going to hand over my whole budget to a load of kids to say, you know, Channel 5 is in your hands, it would be an absolute disaster. Um, you know, I, as I said, I'm all for nurturing talent, but I think there's ways and means of doing it. And I think um, Charlotte's point is really good. Okay, well, of course, I should have said that Shane Smith's gonna be on with Jay later yeah. on, so he will get, a right, he will yeah. get a right of reply. Yeah. You'll remember that odious word, I am sure. No. Oh. Okay, <laughs> well, well um, what Vice is really known, I suppose, as, as we've been discussing, is it about its appeal to uh, younger viewers. So how can the people here compete? Liz Warner, founder of the successful indie company Betty, I'm sure you'll know, had this to say. She said, my gut has been telling me for a couple of years now that something in television is wrong. Really bold, crazy, inventive ideas were getting knocked back, while predictable ideas with echoes of the past were all getting made. And you could see, really, that since then, those old echoes seem to have been getting rather louder. Good night, sweetheart, keeping up appearances, even blankety blank. Blankety blank, really, Kevin? Yes, of course. Of course. Why? <laughs> why? Why, of course? <laughs> because we're at the cutting edge of entertainment. <laughs> um, no, because it's a, it's a Christmas treat. So it is, I said there must be Christmas trees, and I want David Walliams, who's obviously wonderful and is hosting, to have a, some sort of Santa's hat on at some point, and it will be an enjoyable romp. Could there be an enjoyable romp with David Walliams? Uh, in a new show created yes. for him? Yes. Even, you... even including the Santa hat? <laughs> yes, they could, and we're working on those as well. Could Blankety Bank come back to see? <laughs> no, we are, we are. We are. <laughs> um, but, uh, so Charlotte, a, a lot of the programmes that we saw there are BBC ones. I mean, is it derivative just to go back to the past? Are these, these shows well-loved? But well, isn't it well we, of course, are doing the new uh, David Rallion show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, I, you know, I think if, if all we were doing was harking back to the past for all of us, I think if that's all we were doing, of course, you've got to put it in the range of, of all the fantastic new programmes we have across entertainment, across drama, factual comedy. Um, you know, we're all about taking risks and making, you know, there's been, I, don't know, I think it's 100 new titles in the last couple of years on BBC One. Sure, but these so, are expensive programmes, aren't they? And they're taking money away yeah. from new, new content, well, aren't they? Well, both of these, I think, have been fantastic. They're part of the comedy sitcom season across across channels, we've got 21 uh, comedy pieces, which I think it's a fantastic celebration of the British uh, sitcom. 
Um, and it's been a great way of galvanising both the very best writers, so like Ian Lafrenet and Dick Clement, who, you know, the original writers of Porridge, who were delighted to go, yeah, let's write the sequel, let's write the grandson story, and a great opportunity for, for Kevin to play that part. Yeah, even Patricia so, Routledge, you know, Hyacinth Bouquet, she says, bringing back, keeping up appearances is, quotes, desperate. Well, we're not, we're, we're, we're reinventing it for a modern audience, and it's the, it's the prequel for that one, and that was what uh, Roy wanted to write. And I think it's been really exciting, uh, kind of galvanising everybody to come and come together to create a whole season of the British sitcom. Um, on BBC Two, we've got, I think it's seven new pieces, um, which are all original, lots of opportunity for both new writing talent as well as uh, new talent on the screen. Again, it's seeing it in the context. We all know that our audience, you know, I think they're going to thoroughly enjoy watching uh, Porridge and Are You Being Served for a Modern Audience. Um, and I think we all know that, of course, there's, a, there's an element of the love of nostalgia and looking back as well as looking forward. Ben Frau, do you think this kind of commissioning shows a lack of imagination? No, I think that it's so easy to be dismissive and go, oh, television's boring and we don't take risks. You know, everyone on the stage has responsibilities of, of, of a certain kind. We have to balance the books. We have to make sure that we re remain... You know, everyone keeps slagging off the terrestrials, going, oh, we're dead. We're still here, standing here four years later. Mm -hmm. And we're working bloody hard to try and keep our businesses as alive as possible. And you have to balance creativity and risk with sort of some fundamental grunt work. Those shows that are maybe less exciting, but that deliver viewers and reward viewers week in, week out. I mean, Bake Off's just come back and done ten and a half million. You know, when that, that took 11 and a half years to get commissioned, if I understand correctly. You know, so that was a big risk at the time. And now it's a, a, a big family, you know, nation fav na nation's favourite. Um, it's all about balance. I think at Channel 5, we have a great raft of returning hit shows, and we also like to take risks with whether it's Gangland or Body Donors or, you know, Gift of Life programmes that we know won't rate that well, that are left of field for the Channel 5 viewer but that are moving it gradually in a different direction. It's got to be about balance. We're businesses at the end of the day. Gary Davy, do you think this is something about the British character, this n nostalgia, this in enjoyment of looking back to the past? No, I don't think it's unique to Britain. I mean, first of all, I love those franchises. I think they're just great television. And it doesn't really matter what the heritage is. It's just great television. So I'm very happy they're back. Uh, look, I, th I think... I'm enormously optimistic about where we are as an industry creatively. I don't think TV has ever been as exciting as it is right now across every genre. Uh, and the technology is driving us as well. So I think the combination of where we're at creatively and where technology is pushing us, this is, like, for me, a high point in the history of TV. So, yeah, look, I, you can easily criticise all of us about some of our choices, but I certainly wouldn't pick that out as a problem. And Jay, let's look at one of your choices. You decided to revive um, TFI. Uh, that had to be cancelled when um, Chris Evans went off to, to Top Gear, but now to Top Gear is no longer. Are you tempted to bring that back? I think Top Gear still is, isn't it, Charlotte? Yeah, 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 although that, 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 that is a news line. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, didn't want to interrupt. And also, we didn't, we didn't cancel TFI. We brought TFI back for a short run, and then Chris went and did Top Gear. Yeah. Um, is TFI coming back? No. No, not tempted? No. no. OK, even because it did, did quite well for you. Yeah, it did really well for us. But I think, you know, particularly at four, because of the responsibility we have around innovation, that nostalgia card is a big card to play. But I think very, very, very carefully about what we bring back, because I think we do have responsibility to move on. But I mean, the one thing I would add to this is, and it's been a real theme of this festival, the cult of the young is absolutely right. We need to focus on new audiences. But we're in real danger of sort of demonising old people now. And it's got to a slightly curious place that with an ageing demographic globally, for commercial business in particular, it's OK to make shows for people who are over 34. I think it's just OK to say that out loud. So I think we're sort of in danger of overcorrecting a bit too far now. OK, but I think that, that overcorrecting maybe does have a bit of a way to go. If we look at the average age of some of the, the channels here, and um, let, let me ask you guys, uh, what would you think the average age is of BBC One and Two combined? Charlotte, you're not allowed to answer. Any, any, any suggestions? 50? 62 is the right answer. Very good. 62. Thank you. Okay. ITV. 17. <laughs> That's you, Kevin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> any, any suggestions for ITV? Uh, 50, uh, 60. Uh, Channel 4? Any idea? 55 is the right answer. You see, I could have a quiz show. Uh, E4, Youth Channel? Allegedly, 42, and Channel 5, and 58. 
Um, so I'd be quite keen to hear from younger members of the audience now. I don't know if there's anybody here from the network scheme or ones to watch about how you consume television, what you would like these guys to be doing more of for you. Any, anybody from the audience would like to come on at this point? I know this is always this kind of tumbleweed moment. Maybe they're all up so late last night that none of them are even here. <laughs> Okay, all right, well, have, have, a, have a think, and we might come back to that a little bit uh, later on. So if there is a way of trying to attract younger viewers, is this it? We learned from Ofcom that Celebrity Big Brother has had 1,337 complaints. Some are still being assessed. Um, naked Attraction, 276 complaints under assessment, and 40 complaints about Love Island sex under the sheet scene, which was shown just 10 minutes after the watershed, and one's being investigated for potential breaches of the code. And um, Kevin, the Ofcom code says broadcasters must ensure that material after the watershed, which contains images of a strong or explicit sexual nature, is justified uh, by the context. I mean, cynics might say that the real context is simply that sex appeals to younger viewers. Surely not. <laughs> um, no, look, I think with Love Island, uh, it was fun and a laugh. And it's the, curiously, it's the same team that make I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. And so it's a great big, enormous production every day. It was a tremendous triumph for us. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You didn't actually see anything. It was all implied and people were laughing at it. And so the context of these things is always important. And uh, I think it was just a bit of fun. Obviously, you do see rather more in uh, Naked Attraction, which the Telegraph called sensationalist and the lowest common denominator with a vengeance. Oh, you look proud. Well, That's because, I mean, honestly, you don't commission a show like that and think this is going to get the qualities, they're going to love this. I mean, it's just, it's not that sort of show. And yet, you know, I don't want to sound pompous about it, but that show is there for a very, very simple reason, which is I think we have a responsibility to talk to young people about the way in which that world has changed for them. This is a swipe left, swipe right culture. So for us to engage with that, and we did it really seriously. This is not a, a cheap programme. We've thought about it long and hard. But what you don't see in that clip, which I think is rather extraordinary, is you have a guy with dreadlocks, an elephant tattoo on his penis, and a prosthetic leg, and he is chosen as the date. So you tell me a better example of diversity on British television today. I mean, I just, <laughs> honestly, I think this is about body image. It's about normalising what people think about. It's, it's getting away from that porn culture of perfect images. So I think it's a really extraordinary show. Are young people watching it? Yes, in their droves. It's doing double-digit young share for us. Is, is it normalising it, though? Because quite often, in the ones I've seen, it's, it's it's the people who, who actually don't have the great bodies are the ones that are dismissed, isn't it, creating You haven't more? watched enough, Martha. You okay. need to watch a lot more. But, okay. you know, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, that oddly, and I think that's been really reassuring. First of all, people are watching it together, and I think it makes you see different sorts of bodies in different sorts of ways. But one of the things that I, we felt very strongly about is it does confound expectations. It's not always the, you know, perfect model who's chosen at the end of it. And I think that's been a really interesting way for us to engage a young audience who are used to Tinder, used to Grindr, used to, you know snog, marry, avoid type ways of approaching dating and physicality. So I, I'm really proud of it and it's done a good job for us. Uh, in, in that sense, and why did you decide to move it to later? I only moved it to later, really boring. We can talk about it though, because we had a show that ran for 90 minutes, so Big Fat yeah, Quiz is a 90 minute show, so we didn't move it later for any other reason. Okay, so it would go back to yeah, a normal yeah. idea. And then Ben, of course, we saw the kind of scene there from um, Celebrity Big Brother. That when was a mild scene, you didn't actually see anything, you just heard it. You just heard it, okay. Mm. So well, well, judging by what we heard, do you think when you hear the, the sex noises in the loo, do you think, great, you know, that celebrity big brother, do you punch the air or do you think, oh no, that's sort of six months for an Ofcom complaint? No, we've not had an Ofcom complaint held up in over three years since I've been at the channel. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always, you know, kids like sex and they like confrontation. Big Brother provides both those. It's a 17-year-old show, so this is a very old story. I do think there are lines that I won't cross with Big Brother and there are scenes that I don't want to TX. I think, you know, fun is interesting. When you're looking at the relationship with the people, that's interesting. And occasionally, for me, it, it does cross a line, and um, I would choose not to transmit that bit. But kids like sex. I seem to remember liking sex myself when I was young. I'm now <laughs> almost the perfect Channel 5 demographic of 58, and I've got to be true. I'm not so keen on it's sex. Just a, it's just a distant memory for you. Hmm? Just a distant memory for Very you. Very distant memory. <laughs> Uh, well, just a reminder, if you'd like to join in, do put your hands up and we can uh, come to you at any point. So, um, uh, Charlotte, would you ever commission a programme like um, Love Island? Yeah, I, think, attraction? I think it's slightly patronising to suggest that young audiences only want to watch programmes about sex. I mean, I think, you know, you have to look at The Great British Bake Off. It's the biggest programme on, uh, you know, on, on television 
uh, in terms of young audiences. Three million people, young people from 1634, come to British Bake Off. Some of the other biggest shows are The Apprentice on BBC Two. Some of the biggest shows are Louis Theroux drinking to oblivion. Um, actually, our films about Brexit that we did in the run-up to the referendum were some of the biggest uh, young share on BBC Two. So I think young people like a range, they like a variety, they want to be informed about the world, they want to know, um, you, you know, they want to know about history, they want to know about science, they want entertainment too. And I think, you know, all of these things uh, are important to young audiences. You know, BBC One is the biggest channel for young uh, and diverse audiences. I think it's extraordinary when there's that much choice out there that actually that many young people come to the channel. And I think that is because actually there's a real appetite to get around the telly, to share viewing, to want to be there for the big events, whether that's Bake Off, whether that's the Olympics, whether that's the referendum. Seen from Game of Thrones, if you don't watch it, brother and sister there, some people might say verging on paedophilia. Is this something that you're comfortable at Sky's broadcasting? <laughs> well, first of all... <laughs> that's unfair. That's unfair. Well, first of all, I, I, I think it's a bit silly because it's not like sex and violence on TV is a new idea. I mean... I feel like I've been defending it for most of my adult life. And in fact, I'm not sure it's any worse or better than it's ever been, really. Uh, and I think a, a part of the issue is context. And I think, you know, if somebody's tuning into Celebrity Big Brother, I mean, it's hardly, you know, it'd be unusual for somebody to discover uh, unexpectedly the content. And I think Sky Atlantic in particular is a really good example of, I think people know what to expect there. It's challenging content, uh, and whether it's the story structure, the characters, or indeed the intensity of the content in sex and violence. I think the context really matters. It's interesting in the this year with season six of Game of Thrones, which was pretty intense. Um, out of the seven million households that watched it, we've had three complaints. Because the audience know what to expect. Yeah. But I suppose, I mean, one of the criticisms that is made is, yes, it is certainly, um, there is a lot of sexual violence, but the sexual violence is far more directed towards the women characters. And the uh, rape of Sansa was raised in the US Senate, and it was criticised for using rape as female character development. Well, I think that's nonsense. I mean, first of all, there's an awful lot of violence to men as well. For anybody who's watched the show, it can be a very violent show. Yeah. I don't think the violence against women is particularly highlighted. It's just part of the story. I mean, the, and, the, and the rape happens, and it, it's part of the story. It was in the book, um, and we're now off the books. We're now in original scripts, so the story's evolving. But... You know, and those, do, and those do you change? I mean, have you cha made a deliberate decision to change any of the sexual violence now that you're, you've moved away from the books? No, not without the consultation of the original author. So, but, no, sure, you consult, but that is one of your aims, is it, for, for the news newer series? No, not really. I mean, we, we, we got ahead of the books, so we had to write original news, content. Yeah. So we've done that in conjunction with the original author. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I think the complaint level experience clarifies that I think our audience A knows what to expect on Sky Atlantic, B know what to expect in a show like Game of Thrones, and we've got very sophisticated pin protection mechanisms on both our linear content and our on-demand content where, where it's driven by age. And 97% of our customers know about the pin protection system, and nearly 65% of them use it regularly. Yeah, so there is some form of protection, which I suppose isn't so true of BBC. And when it comes to a series like Versailles, some parents might have thought it was a historical lesson. Clearly not. Um, interesting history. Um, but uh, the Conservative P, Andrew Bridgen, had said, is this an example of the BBC dumbing down or seeking more sensationalised programme? Either way, it amounts to an arms race to the bottom, he says quite literally in this case. <laughs> so no, I mean, no, obviously... Uh, for young people, it, there's, a, there's a, you know, you heard the warning that says, just to warn you, this, this has explicit scenes. Um, but I think, you know, Versailles is in a strong tradition of acquisitions on the channel, which, you know, we, the Tudors was another example of a good historical drama. You know, the court of Louis XIV, we all know, was a court that, um, you know, was, was debauched. And there was, you know, it was a, um, that, that's for historical record. So I think it's very much in the tradition of, of a BBC Two 
um, acquisition drama. And I think for anyone who actually went on to watch it, I think you know, we know that our audiences have really loved it and been really entertained by it. Ben, do you think you can get away with more sex on television if they're in costume, if they're in breeches? No, I just think we're being slagged off for being boring, and then we're being slagged off because, you know, there's one programme called Naked Attraction, it might be a subset of people, in, in a, one programme in a whole channel of programmes, and there's, you know, a couple of scenes in Celebrity Big Brother, which is one programme out of thousands of hours of commissions, and it's like, you, you sort of can't win, and it just gets a bit tedious that we keep being held to account on teeny tiny things when, you know, there's quite, you know, quite a lot of responsibility and quite a lot of challenges and quite a lot of X, Y, and Z. Um, is nakedness in a costume, or not in a costume in this case, um, more acceptable? Uh, I don't have a problem with nudity in the right context, in the right program. If it's called Versailles, if it's, if it's Game of Thrones, I'd expect to see it. It happens in movies, it happens in a lot of things. And I don't really understand why we're sort no, of getting so caught things. up in this very small thing. Quite it's tiny. It's not even like millions of clips are really shocking clips. 58 complaints or something. Yeah, and you know, in the old days, we would have got those in green ink in a letter. Um, some of them are justified and we have to take them seriously. But, you know, I, I, I agree with Ben. I think, oh, chill out, it's fine. The problem with the side is just it wasn't very good. I mean... <laughs> That's a different you know, <laughs> Well, our audience really enjoyed it. Well, <laughs> our audience, I don't know, come on. <laughs> Okay, and I think we've got a question from the audience. Is there somebody at the back? Uh, still, did somebody Nothing. have their head up Nothing. earlier? Bottled out? Okay, it was the, oh yes, here we are, lovely, thank you very much. Off you go. Hi, good morning. I um, wanted to ask a question based on the comment about young people just liking TV shows about sex. Um, as a young person myself and a few other people that are with us that are doing a debate later on, we found that young people enjoyed watching the debates and things that actually educated young people we could talk about. Do you, any of you feel that that's the type of content that you're looking to produce more rather than just the same repetitive sexual shows in different ways on a different channel? Jay? Well, in the nicest possible way, I think this is becoming a slightly moribund conversation. I don't think we all get up in the morning saying, what sex show can we put on tonight for young people? I mean, I, I, I certainly don't. It's a tiny, tiny part of what we do. And I would encourage you to look at some of our big factual entertainment shows, something like Hunted, which we spent a very, very long time trying to get right, to really get under the skin of, of how we deal with digital privacy for a young audience. So I think, are we using every creative bone we've got in our body with the producers we work with to find interesting ways of bringing these subjects alive? Definitely. Will I be commissioning lots of shows of people sitting around debating? No, I won't, because I think in the end we need to try harder to get really difficult content to young audiences, and it needs to be entertaining and informative, and I think that's a legitimate challenge for everyone on this panel to think how we do that. So I think it'd be a bit of a backward step, actually, if we went back to having chaired debates. I think they'll get a very small audience, and we need to be more ambitious than that. Victoria on ITV, but for seven out of its eight weeks, it's going to be directly against Poldark, something a lot of people in the audience complain about. Um, Kevin, is this kind of thing that ITV has complained about in the past, seeing its aggressive scheduling? Does it worry you? Um, I, I don't know who ever complained. Um, it's six weeks, not eight, seven. Uh, I think Peter Fincham no, complained about it, I think, on yes, this stage did, last year. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, look what happened to him. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> I don't know. The, um, look... It would be best if BBC One, at the time that we're playing Victoria, had some marvellous public service film about LGBT matters that <laughs> Shane would say would bring in ratings. Uh, and similarly for the BBC, it'd be better if we had um, something boring on. But Sunday night is a particular place, I'd say, for nine o'clock dramas in both our long and uh, esteemed heritage of costume dramas. Um, Victoria's obviously been, you know, a year in the making. Uh, ITV doesn't have as much stock, as much, you know, ability to change. If, if we run away from Poldark, say, I don't know what we really would have put there. Um, and I think there, there are enough viewers for both shows to succeed. They're both ironically made by uh, an ITV company. Um, oh, I see, so silver lining for you. Yes, I'm, I'm either win-win or lose-lose. I can't work it out. But... Um, <laughs> I, I think they will both do well. They're both really good shows. Uh, and, you know, you can record people watching different ways. There's many times to watch these shows. I think, I think they'll both work. And neither of us should 
give up the land in a certain place. I think it would be wrong to the viewers to run away from a certain thing. Oh, look, there's a big show. We can't put anything that we believe in against it. We'll just put repeats of some old stuff. And so uh, I think occasionally, and it is, it is only occasionally, um, there is a bit of a clash of similar shows. But that's life. It's always been that way, and I think it's fine. And Jay, you've seen both sides of this, controller of BBC One, you know, now yeah. a channel that has to worry about advertising. It can be difficult for a commercial channel because they, it, it's a different, different ball game for them, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I, everyone always says, well, you're a very competitive controller of BBC One. And yes, I was, but I think, you know, you can emerge into the commercial sector and see things slightly differently. I, I mean, it, I, honestly, it's a bit six of one, half a dozen of the other. I remember being at one, an endless tussle about Strictly versus X Factor, and so it goes on. I mean, I, I'm sure Kevin's right, the two can coexist quite happily. I do think, and I said this last year, that the BBC needs to be mindful of the impact of those scheduling decisions, because I know, I sat there, there is no consequence if it doesn't work for the BBC. There's a very real consequence for a big, expensive, I suspect, topping up of well over a million quid an hour on a drama like that doesn't work for a commercial channel. So, I mean, my, my own sense of it is it's slightly better than it was a year ago, actually, in terms of some of these issues. But yeah, I, I think it will run and run this one. Sure. Well, I think, you know, my duty is to the licence fee payers and to our audience and trying to find the best place in the schedule for a piece that we know is much loved by the audience is incredibly important. And as Kevin says, you know, it's a strong tradition of big dramas on Sunday night. This is the beginning of the autumn season. It's incredibly important. I want to put, you know, one of the most loved uh, dramas on television at the moment in that spot. And I think it would be very wrong to be moving that out of that. But won't some of your audiences also be wanting to watch Victoria, and okay, people will record programmes, yeah, but they the like brilliant. to be able to talk to, talk to you know, people over the water cooler the next day, <laughs> they like to follow it on Twitter. So they do like watching live TV Well, as I think well. that's the brilliant thing that, you know, as, as Kevin says, I'm sure there's an audience for both shows. I think, um, obviously, I think Paul Dutton much anticipated, people can't wait to see it, so I think, but there is catch up when you have to make those choices. I mean, how fantastic that at the moment there is such a rich choice of fantastic television. I don't think it would be fair to the audience to, to, to shy away from that, you know, give the audience choice with some brilliant television. Ben, have you had issues about counter-scheduling, Celebrity Big Brother versus Love Island? Hmm? No, I wish Love Island hadn't got a bloody two weeks head start on us because we um, might have had a bit of an easier ride over the summer. But, you know, it is competitive out there. We're a commercial channel. I, I pick my battles. Um, I keep my eye on Jay and Kevin as the other commercial channels and we try and do the very best we can. And I think if we weren't competitive, really, really competitive, we wouldn't have achieved what we have done in the last three and a half years. Um, uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter what you play against what, there's always going to be competition, there's always going to be something else you'd like to also watch on another channel. Luckily, in my day and age, you just had to watch it live on two channels, all that was it. And nowadays, you've got all these other apps and online and things like that. So I think viewers are very uh, lucky nowadays that they, they are able to watch programmes after the live event. I will make a decision about which one I watch on Sunday. Um, both of them will be very rewarding. But we're always going to be competitive with each other because that's the nature of the beast. And I then pick my battles with, you know, my nearest rivals for commercial impact. <laughs> certainly do. And Gary Davy, what do you make about this kind of debate? It must, it must be very different looking at it from the point of view of Sky, this yeah, kind of I, scheduling. Does it seem very yeah, old-fashioned? Well, I thought yeah. I was going to say that I don't belong in the middle of a scrap between ITV and BBC about scheduling, but it doesn't appear to be a scrap. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think, you know, the, the point is, is a good one. The, 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 the viewer has so many opportunities now to watch television where they want, when they want, on whatever device they want. You know, our customers have got seven different opportunities to, to consume content, and we genuinely don't care how or when or on what device they do that. Uh, so I think the world's moved on, and I, I, I just think we're in a different space, and I suspect that's why we don't have a scrap about scheduling. But we should, I should say, Kevin, congratulations, that looks great. Thank you. <laughs> on both shows. Mm. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's I wouldn't go Johnson. that far. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the broadcaster's coverage, the pro Remain peer and filmmaker David Putnam says that during the campaign, broadcasters, particularly BBC, were hamstrung by the rules of impartiality. As soon as one campaigner on one side said something, the broadcasters found somebody else um, to counter it. Um, so the question really is, is whether you think the rules on balance and impartiality need to be changed. And, you know, Jay, you were in news for a long time, so you understand um, how this works. And we know that you know, impartiality isn't just 
A versus B is, it's much more complex than that. Mm. It is more complex. Well, I, th I think this is a really interesting point. And certainly the very reductive he says, she says, piece to camera thing that I would commission a minute of overnight for breakfast all the years ago, I think that is quite reductive. But I think there, there's a complicated thing going on here, which we are going to have to wrestle with. And to a certain extent, Shane touched on it last night. The internet is full of partial views about all sorts of things. Do I think, therefore, it matters even more now that somewhere in the middle of this complex world we have terrestrial channels, and the BBC in particular, trying to navigate and make sense of that? Yeah, I really think it does. And, and, and the alternative to impartial self-evidently is partial. Well, where does that get you? I mean, I, I think it's probably never mattered more. Those clips are clips of politicians not telling the truth. Twas ever thus. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that moves this debate on hugely. So, I think you can go and get your information wherever you want to get it now. It matters very, a great deal, I think, to everybody that you have places you can go to where there is the ambition of balance. And, and I think we need to keep uh, adhering to that. And also, I mean, the broadcast has made an effort. I think Channel 4 News led the way on this, and the BBC have also done it with yeah. Reality Check, where there are places that you can go to, and the broadcasters will actually call out false claims. Absolutely, yeah. and you know, one of the yeah. huge areas of success for us recently has been syndication of short-form content on all platforms. And I think for Facebook, for Channel 4 News viewers, we're now ahead of followers for BBC One. So I think part of our mission needs to be to get that information out there on all platforms and to help in this wider debate. Mm -hmm. But I don't think saying, let's chuck impartiality out the window is the solution to this. And uh, how did Gary Davey sometimes with, with rolling news on news channels, things happen very quickly. You can't spend all day setting up a perfectly balanced debate. Mm. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. Over time, you normally do. There's almost a natural balance that comes through that, provided you've got really smart people doing the work. I, I was pretty proud of uh, where we got through that campaign. It was a difficult campaign. It was complicated. Uh, and I think Faisal Islam's interviews with David Cameron and Michael Gove kind of reset the tone of the campaign quite a lot. And I was comforted by the fact that both sides accused me of being barracking for the other side. So that's always a good sign that you've probably got the balance right. And, and uh, Charlotte Moore, I know news isn't directly in, involved in, in, your, in your very big job already, but you're aware of the, of the issues. And I suppose it comes a point where people are you know, worried that they weren't getting the information that they needed to make up their minds. And um, I think a lot of opinion polling said people d didn't feel that they had the facts. So did the broadcasters let them Well, I think we down? did an incredible job of laying out what was an incredibly complex and actually fast moving. I mean, the arguments and the, the information that was being put forward was changing day, day, week, week. You know, so I, I, I think the news uh, teams did a fantastic job. I know James Harding's here, if anyone wants to question further about it. But I, I genuinely think, and I agree with Jay, that I think you have to strive to be impartial you have to try and give a voice as we absolutely you know we're, we're rigid about trying to give a voice to all the different opinions and this was an incredibly complex uh, referendum actually I think you know we hadn't had something like that in this country before and I think making sure that you reflected those opinions and those different views uh, was, in, was, was incredibly important and I think the news team did an incredible job actually. Ben, what approach did Channel 5 News take? I mean, is there a temptation to move more towards, I mean, you're bound by Ofcom regulation, but to move into kind of the areas around polemic, as Jay was describing, that we see so much from the internet? No, I think we, you know, we were fair and balanced. You know, we've got great teams working on our news. We are, we t our news tends to female, uh, skew female, and we skewed female. Um, we decided not to go big on Brexit because the other broadcasters were going big on Brexit, and again, I, I have to pick my battles. Um, and it was mainly covered in the news and the right stuff. I think they did a brilliant job of it. I think it was very fair. I think what caused such confusion was the fact that it became so emotional, is that if all the facts are there and you're laying out the facts and the different points of views, but then suddenly emotion kicked in, and that's probably what caused so much confusion out there to viewers. Yes, and also I think, I mean, from my own news experience, people were searching for clarity over things that there isn't necessarily clarity mm. about because it was looking into the future, it was crystal ball gazing, where there, isn't, there aren't hard facts that people were searching for. Yeah, I also think that, let's be clear, there's never been a time when news is, 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 is sort of more important than it is now. And I, I think it's absolutely incumbent on, on the public service broadcasters to keep investing in news, keep being rigorous about what it is. It's, it's, it really is the most important thing because there's a plethora of news things out there. And those of us that have children growing up and stuff, you see them going on the internet finding stuff and going, oh, look, I heard it. And you think, you know, completely nonsensical, uh, uncorroborated information. And it's incumbent on us to provide as much as we can, for we are flawed people, to uh, provide a balanced uh, and respectable news output. And I think we all do largely. The other thing is that 
people you know are smarter than often they're given credit for. And they can see, when they see a politician squirming like that, they understand immediately what's happening. And I think the sort of the balance, the micro analysis of balance of did you one person say this and say that is less important. Um, and, and, and as Gary says, I think over time, we, it, it does even itself out. But uh, viewers can, the great thing is to just show them stuff and get politicians on talking and let the viewers make up their own mind. Is there an issue, Jay, though, around a, about trust in the so-called mainstream media? People talk about living in a post-facts, post-truth world where they will more likely to believe what's on their Facebook page that a friend has sent onto them than, say, on Channel 4 News. Yeah, but that's one of the reasons we have doubled down in the syndication of our content on social media platforms, for exactly that reason. I think it's vitally important right now that, that news organisations that are actively trying to, to be impartial in their coverage and to deliver on that factual information that will allow people to make big decisions are reaching the audience wherever they may be. I mean, one of the huge challenges we're all aware of is ageing audiences for news. So, you know, and again, that's why the Vice thing is, is not on interesting. We've got to get out there and get proper impartial content to people who are going to be forming decisions in the next 20, 30 years that will affect the future of the world without going to sound sort of, you know, bombastic about it. So I, th I think part of it is this indication thing and part of it is continuing to win trust back by giving people the information to form the decisions. What's been most successful for you in terms of syndication amongst young people? Well, we've just had an extraordinary, I mean, I, I really encourage you to watch it. It's extraordinarily life affirming. We've just had a, a clip on Facebook, which has got, I think, 32 million views. It's only been up, I think, about a week, which is of a baby being born in Aleppo in extraordinary circumstances. And I think, again, it speaks to that agenda. There is an appetite to understand complex issues, but it needs to be packaged in a way that a young audience in particular will find and actively want to share with other people. Thank you all for those uh, thoughts. I'd like to move on now and to talk about pay at the highest and lowest rungs of TV. The BBC's top earners, Gary Lineker, 1.8 million, Chris Evans, 1.6 million, Graham Norton, 1.3 million. How do we know this? Well, the BBC has reluctantly agreed to publish the names and salaries of everyone on salaries of more than £450,000, which is what the Director General is paid. But MPs on the Media Select Committee want to go much further than this. This month they said that if you work at the BBC and are paid more than the Prime Minister's salary, that's 143000 then the public should know the details. The BBC is not happy and says this would lead to an exodus of top talent. So, Charlotte Moore, do you think the public does have a right to know about who are being paid more than the Prime Minister? I, I just, um, as I said yesterday, I don't think it's in the licence fee payers' interest that, that, that those are made transparent. I think in the end it will just drive talent fees up. But, and, I, and I think we know that our audiences want to see you know, some of the best talent on our channels. Um, and I think that's our duty to, to make sure that talent can be at the BBC. I mean, clearly we, we're not able to, play, to pay the, the sums that other broadcasters can. Um, and I think there are other reasons why talent want to be at the BBC because of the creative freedom that we can give them. Um, but I think, no, I don't believe that that would be a good idea for anybody. Ben? I'm surprised that those numbers are so low, actually. Um, I thought they'd all be paid a lot more than that. Uh, I, I agree with Charlotte. I, I just, I think this... Um, uh, holding the BBC to account on those salaries kind of thing kind of slightly worries me. Talent is so important to an organisation. It gives you an identity, it brings you viewers. It, you know, the BBC is such a jewel in our crown and we seem so determined to try and devalue it. And the post-Brexit, I feel even stronger than ever that, you know, we need the jewels in our crown and, you know, allow... I, I pay my licence fee and I trust that the people who run the BBC spend my money in the best way they see fit to give me the content that will most reward me. Uh, I don't need to know who earns this and who earns that. It doesn't make me feel better about anything. I, I think Graham Norton deserves to be paid more. But I suppose, it's, it, in the case of the BBC, it is the public who are paying for these salaries. Yes, but you can't... Uh, what, you have a referendum on whether Gary Lineker should get an extra 100,000 again? I, I, I think it's, it's a sort of mean-spirited, nosy kind of uh, way of looking at things. And... I don't think the BBC should publish it. It's also, do you know, people will just find ways to get round it. If you, if you're Graham Norton, owned by ITV and run a production company, um, you, you would say, all right, I'll tell you what, BBC, pay us, I don't know, £200,000 a show for the programme. That sounds like a, a sort of price it would cost. And the BBC won't know what Graham Norton's getting paid. And then he won't have to tell. So I, I think it would be un it wouldn't get to where people want it to be, which is revealing everybody's fee. And I don't know any other part of the world where you have to know what everybody else earns. So I think it's um, it's a waste of everyone's time, and we should just let it go. Jay, what do you think about the kind of MPs' intervention in this? 
That's quite an interesting lesson in talent fraud, though, actually, Charlotte, one worth taking away there. But um, <laughs> what do I think? I think that, actually, the, what worries me most about this, um, having done the job at one, actually, is the law of unintended consequences. So where does this get you? We make loads of important shows about ISIS and all sorts of things, but I think it's vitally important, particularly on one, you're still in entertainment, you're still in big popular factual, you're still making dramas that will cut through with mass audiences. They are often driven by talent. So if you pursue this, I think you'll end up in a situation where the BBC isn't competitive on genres that are vitally important to the future sustainability of the BBC. It can't be right that the BBC cannot be competitive for entertainment. It can't be right that they can't be in the market trying to get the sorts of talent that will bring mass audiences on a Saturday yeah, night. Leave it is to entertain. I mean, it would be exactly. So if we this don't is take really weird because everyone agrees. So this is all a bit strange. But but uh, but ge but gen great, genuinely, really. I think it would. I mean, you know, on one level, why are either Kevin or I arguing? This would be fantastic, and we could sail in and go, okay, right, Chris Evans is 1.5 million or whatever it needs. I, I don't think it's helpful, and I think it puts the BBC massively on the back foot in a way which is unhelpful for license fee payers, actually. So I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of concentration on the very um, higher standards in television, but is there an, an issue about you know the pay at the top and then the pay at the bottom? I'm sure some of the young people here will have um, thoughts about this. Back to the union is saying it's exploitation, and they've called for so-called P contracts. That's P for person, in essence, a buyer of overtime to be stopped. I mean, Charlotte Moore, how comfortable are you with the idea that the young people working for very long hours not being paid the right amount of money? No, I think this is an industry-wide issue that we must pay people properly to do the jobs that they're there to do. Um, and also to make sure that at that entry point when people come in that they can, you know, live their lives and not work ridiculous hours. So, yes, I think it's an industry-wide issue that we all have to... Uh, is that something that Sky addresses? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we're very conscious of the, the production companies we work with. We <coughs> like to know about their ethics and their standards. But the truth is, you know, as a capitalist, you know, I like the idea of meritocracy. And, you know, the entry point is going to be low paid. And, and young people need to develop skills, prove their worth, and work their way up um, the creative food chain, to use the terminology. So, I, look, I think the laws of supply and demand apply quite naturally in business. If there, are, if there are people who are working hard and adding value, making a contribution, inevitably there's reward. Of course, we have to have safety nets, and we have to check the ethical behaviour of all of our production partners. But I think we do that as a matter of course. I mean, my own story, I, my first job in media, I was earning the equivalent of six pounds a week. Um, but that's a good while ago. <laughs> um, it's moved on a, a little since then. <laughs> Certainly, we'd, we'd hope a, a little since then. But, Kevin, I suppose the problem is if the pay is too low at the bottom, then it mitigates having um, a more meritocratic industry which reflects the country. It'll be people whose parents can afford to support them in those low-paid jobs. I mean, I think people have, there's been action against unpaid internships. But still, if the low is very pay, who, uh, pay is very low, who can afford to live in London on those kind of rates? Yeah, no, we, we have to watch that. But there is a, a sense of... A lot of people want to work in television, more people than there are jobs there's going to be a sort of fight for it. Um, but we, if, I'm sure if anyone on this panel heard that there was genuine kind of exploitation, people working too long, all, all the rest of it, we would step in and go, you can't do that, that's awful. It's difficult from up here to police every single runner's employment, but I think the message should be clear, and is clear, uh, certainly from us, that you know, there is a living wage and we have signed up to that and people must be paid that at the very least. Um, but traditionally, people have worked very hard and long hours in television and then had quite a lot of time off. It's not a regulated, regimented job. So, um, look, it's, it's, we need to keep watching it because, of course, you don't want people being exploited. But um, uh, lots of people want to work in television, and, and God bless them for that. God bless them indeed. I mean, Jay, is this something with the companies that work for Channel 4, do you actively pursue to check that they're... Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is... We don't... We're not in production, so as you say, it's a contracted relationship. And I just echo what the others have said around us policing that carefully within these. We want the right standards there. I mean, I actually think the major reason we need to stay on top of this is part of the broader diversity debate around social mobility, exactly as Cohen said. You know, we, we will stop people coming into this sector if they have to be sort of trustafarian. So it, it seems to me, for that reason alone, it's something we all need to stay on top of. Lovely, thank you. We're very nearly at uh, the end now, and um, we'd like you to use the apps now, um, if possible. So that's the Edinburgh TV Fest app for um, just a quick snap poll for the end of this session. All you have to do is to press the take part on your app to make this work. 
Is there, yes, I can see some people with their phones out doing it, brilliant. Um, so we get a, a decent response. So the questions are, there are three questions. The first one is, the success of reality TV shows proves that young people have no taste. So vote now, as they say. Uh, B, the broadcaster's relentless pursuit of balance contributed to the Brexit vote. And uh, vote C, talent is paid too much. So they're very uh, black and white questions. <laughs> uh, vote now, and we'll see that if we can get uh, any results uh, coming up for us. Um, and while we're just waiting for the results uh, to come through, I mean, in the wake of the McTav uh, lecture, Ben, how do you see the kind of the health of television? over the next five years. You've well, said you're four years ago, we were all going to be out of jobs and it was all dead and we're still here. And it's, you know, we've had a great year. I know Channel 4 have had a great year. I, you know, uh, I, I still think we're in really rude health. I still believe that television is the number one medium for watching content. Um, how people watch it in the different ways is, you know, completely up to them. It's all, Charlotte mentioned earlier on, it's all about content. And if we still all keep making great content, viewers will come. I really believe that. I, kept it, I keep it very simple. Year on BBC One, where you know the biggest share that we've had since 2008 in, in peak, and I kind of think with all the competition, with all the choice out there, the fact that's still the case is great. And I also think it's been the year where BBC Three has gone online and is having impact in that digital world, and that's very exciting. So I think we're embracing the future, um, and I, I feel very excited about that. I think television at the moment in this country uh, is is experiencing a fantastic age. Jay. I think we're all just boringly saying the same thing. I'm going to spare you the speech about how great Channel 4 is. But I mean, what do I think? I think for a room full of producers, there's a lot of noise and it's never been a better time to make telly programmes. And in the end, that's why we all do what we do. So I think in that sense, it's quite an invigorating period. Briefly. It's, it's a disaster. <laughs> uh, no, 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 of course. Uh, things are great. All the channels are thriving. And um, oh, just keep making good shows and everything will be fine. Yeah, and I think the, the point to add to that is this is all... this. Success is happening at a time when there's all kinds of fresh, well-funded competition coming into the market too. So the, the prediction, as Ben said, the prediction about our demise, I think, is premature. Okay, well, well thank you very much for that optimistic vote. And I've been told that the uh, question A, the first one in the poll, was the most popular amongst the audience. And uh, it was, uh, you agreed with it overwhelmingly. This is the one about um, reality shows and young people. So thank you all very much indeed. First of all, to our C21 Media, who sponsored the event. And do enjoy the rest of the panel. And a big thank you to our very lively and interesting panel. Thank you very much indeed.